one of my things was to buy oldies. I mean, I always loved buying records. And on a Saturday, I would go to Portobello Market to Ted Carroll's Rock On, which at the time was in a booth in the back of an arcade. And I'd buy stuff from Ted, and I'd say, you know, what are you doing the rest of the week, Ted? And he says, oh, I manage a band. So I said, well, who's the band? And he, he, he said, oh, Finn Lizzy. So I went, shit. I said, what are you doing on Decker? He said, you should come with us. He said, so make me an offer. And I went, pardon? He said, no, we're off, we're off Decker. And he, you know, they'd had whiskey in the jar, but we're off Decker now, and um, we're looking for a deal. We've got these new guitarists. And it's quite a funny story because a couple of days later, Chris Morrison and Chris O'Donnell, who were the managers of Thin Lizzy with Ted, they were taking over the job full time. Ted was taking a, a back seat because he wanted to expand his retail th thing. So Chris and the two Chris's came into my office and they gave me a demo tape, played it, and it was, it was a song called Still In Love With You. And I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm listening to this fabulous guitar solo, and I'm thinking, it's fantastic. This is fantastic, I've got to have this. This is definitely for us. So what I didn't realize until many years later, which has been written in the book, is that on the other side of my desk, while I'm raving in raptures about the guitar solo, Chris O'Donnell is kicking Chris Morrison for all his might on his ankles, not to, just not to not say anything, because I didn't know that the guitar solo wasn't by the new guitarist, it was actually by Gary Moore. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I went to a gig at the Marquee, it was brilliant, and we ended up signing them, and of course it was the most ridiculous deal, because I negotiated, negotiated a deal, I didn't know a deal from my ass to my elbow, and no, nor did the two Chris's. <laughs> And I think they ran out of money after about three weeks. But it, things just happened. And, and you know, the first album was a bit of a disaster. I had no control or idea. They wanted to go with this uh, American producer. Made an album that was very uncommercial and a couple of good tracks on it. But it wasn't until the second album came out that I'd started. I'd, by then, I'd moved into the A&R department. And um, I was actually starting to sort of get to enjoy this, I'd, I'd signed 10CC and I'd signed Steve Miller. You know, the second that the, the Steve, uh, Thin Lizzy album for Vertigo came in and they play it to me. They're all, all the band are there, the two Chris's are there, I'm sitting there in my office and we're playing the album. So, said, what do you think? And I said, I'm disappointed. Well, I mean, talk about lack of cool, right? I'm disappointed. <laughs> Duh! I mean, you why not sugarcoat it? <laughs> you could have cut the atmosphere like a knife. Because they were so shocked that I actually came out and said I'm disappointed. Rather than, yeah, it's great. They said, well, what, what do you want us to do? So I said, okay, I'll tell you what I want you to do. We've had one album where we just went to there. If we can't put an album out that's going to go at least to there, what's the point? I said, I want you to go in and write the best four songs on the album that aren't there at the moment. So I'll give you some more money. Go in and write the best four tracks on the album. They did. They came back a bit later, and they, you know, three weeks later, and they had an, absolutely the four best tracks on the album. So I thought, oh, this is the way to do it. You just got to tell the truth and solve the consequences. And I always did that. All through my A&R career, I just always told the truth. I mean, I got into terrible trouble with some people.